Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. <clears throat> We're going to talk about <clears throat> the omitted part of the media and public communications, and that is <clears throat> the public, the people. What's the message? What's the strategy for us? Who's listening to us? And what should be part of that? And with us, we have retired judge and author, Sandra Sims. She's back from a wonderful trip to Africa and recent past chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution and professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, David Larson. So as part of the omitted, left out part of the communications, the public, Man, what do you want to hear that we haven't? Sandra? Well, we want to hear some uh, compassion. We want to hear some empathy. Um, just an overall sense of recognizing that people have a lot of issues that need to be addressed. We need to see some courage on the part of our um, some of our leaders to take a stance and to, to be committed to uh, committed to the to the to the furtherance of the country, committed to democracy. You don't see certainly don't see that. Um, that's a start, and I'll just start with that. And I have some more thoughts, but we only have a half an hour. So, David, initial thoughts. Well, you know, I'd like to hear some substance. Um, you know, when I'm looking at our Congress these days, I'm seeing a lot of dialogue. And I've seen a lot of argument. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of substance. Um, I read a really interesting article in Politico. Um, it was about a year ago. And it put forth the proposition that one reason why we're not getting any kind of substance out of Congress anymore is that they don't have to. Um, they've come to the conclusion that we don't have to do it because we can look to the Supreme Court to make all the hard decisions. We don't have to try to do national legislation about abortion or about immigration, because we'll just make the court do it. We'll, do, we'll just leave it to them. And we hear a lot about the administrative state. And recall when President Obama was saying, well, if Congress doesn't do anything, you know, I'll do it with the administrative agencies. So Congress says, well, great. You know, let the administrative agencies do the hard things with climate change and um, environmental pollution. We don't have to do it. Um, we have to run for election in the House for every two years. Um, we don't want to look bad. We don't want to make any bad decisions. So we just won't make any decisions. So one thing I'd like to see is to get back to the world where uh, we have a Congress that says, okay, you know, it's really three branches of government, not two. And, you know, we've really been abdicating our responsibility and pushing it off on the court system and leaving it to administrative agencies, although we're more than eager to complain about administrative agencies. The fact is, we're not going to say this. We like them because they give us cover. Um, I'd like to see Congress step up. It's a great insight. So rather than ask the generally unproductive question of how did we get from the days of Tip O'Neill and Bob Dole being able to work together with people on both sides of the aisle and bipartisan stuff to hear, what would it take for us to go back in that direction where people can actually communicate and work in a bipartisan manner, where common ground becomes the source and the ground root of communications. Hmm. I don't know if I like the term going back, but I think we just need to move forward to a time where people can be uh, considerate of other thoughts, where they can agree without being disagreeable. Um, I don't think that's just an open skill. I think it's a skill that's still here, as people are still capable of doing it, but as David's pointed out, they don't have to, at least certainly on the Congress level, there's a feeling that they don't have to. But you'll see that in many in, in a lot of local communities where people are having to make decisions that impact people's everyday lives, that's still occurring um, because they have to. <laughs> they have to sit down and make those decisions that affect, you know, whether it's schools or garbage pickup or, you know, the basic issues. Those have to be done. And so people still know how to do it. It's just that we are in, inundated with symbols and and um, symbols and, and, and people who are not doing it and who revel in their ability not to do it. 
uh, who enjoys just standing there making up words and making up stuff and not doing anything at all, denigrating those that do. Like David pointed out, oftentimes the administrative agencies is where stuff gets done. There's people there doing doing the work every day. And yet we have others who are supposedly in leadership who choose rather to denigrate those folks, uh, to demonize those folks. And they would not be able to do the things that they, well, the little bit that they don't do, they would not be, be able to do that without those folks there. It's just so very, very hypocritical to watch this. I mean, I've kind of almost given up on just stop watching it because it's just so, it's so disgusting. Um, it's, it's just so disgusting to see that. But anyway, that's my thought on that. I don't think we can go back. I think we know how, we just don't see it. And you just, so people just don't do it. So, you, Andre, you've been a judge, you've been mediator, arbitrator. David, you've also been a teacher and mediator and arbitrator. If you get people in front of you who are behaving like that, what do you do to try and make the communication a productive process? Well, one thing you try to do is you try and point out what's in your interest. You know, that's certainly kind of maintaining your position and keep bump, bumping up against the wall isn't really helping you out. Um, you know, try and take a bigger, longer range perspective. And, uh, you know, you might have to step back. You might have to let go. You might have to talk a little bit about um, what you really want to happen here. Um, you're coming in with a pretty strong position. And uh, there's other ways to move forward other than advocating aggressively for your position. Maybe another way to do it is talk a little bit more about your interests and what you'd like to accomplish. So a, a little bit of reorientation is sometimes helpful. And, you know, I think in Congress, we need some reorientation. One problem, one, I think, systemic structural problem is the way that campaign finance operates. Um, you know, you're running for re-election every two years in the House. You know, you've got to raise money or you want to raise money because now in the world of social media and digital information, you need resources to get your message out there. So you're going to spend a lot of time prioritizing your fundraising and you don't want to do or say anything that might alienate a possible donor. Um, so again, there's a there's a the campaign finance system, I think, builds in the distance out of doing anything because you don't want to alienate anybody from whom you're going to get money. So therefore you don't, you don't do anything. So that's an area probably we need to think hard about how we might change our campaign finance rules. You know, that's a really important insight because rather than even being just over a year from major national elections, presidential elections, state elections, rather than speaking to the constituency, eh, it's as if their audience was their donors, eh, the yeah. people with the big money who, who want to throw it mm -hmm. at things that are anti this or anti that, when we know that a substantial mm -hmm. majority of the American people would like women to be able to make the most important reproductive health decisions in their lives eh, without political constraints for that, would like to be able to have affordable health care and affordable medications, uh, would like to be able to have education in which a relatively open exchange of information and ideas takes place. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're hearing, and that's not even the audience that these people are speaking to. You know, I think I think we need to take some responsibility for that. I think all of us do. That um, you know, we're watching what people are doing. We need to call them out and say that. You know, when you're going to insist that we can't even do a short-term budget agreement for you know the CARES to the to the serious budget renegotiation that's got to happen, you can't even refund the government for a short period of time. Um, and all the damage that might do, what are you doing? You know, yeah. What are you doing for me? Um, I think we need to get a little more outspoken and, and, and call 
uh, our representatives out and ask them, what, what are you doing for me? You know, I'm looking at this Jim Jordan subcommittee about the rep weaponization about the, about the government. And uh, it's like, you know, if I'm a constituent of Jim Jordan, I'm saying, what in God's name are you doing for me? You know, what this is, you know, this is purely political driven. It's yeah. it's ironic that you've got a committee about the weaponization, which is exactly what you're doing. It is exactly and your and your candidate, um, Trump has explicitly said, you know, if you go after me, I'm gonna go after you. I mean that's that's just a warning of weaponization. So just stop that. You know, we've got opiate problems in Ohio, we've got all kinds of, you know, we've got plant closings. You know, do something about that. Don't spend time, you know, just just politicizing um, the debate in a, in a crazy subcommittee. And, and I often think about him, too, in terms of what on earth is happening. I should go look it up and what's happening in Ohio and how people are responding to that, because I think he, he's not the only one, but he's certainly the one that's most visible at this point uh, in terms of the use of the, the Congress as just this pulpit for posturing for whatever it is that he happens to be for or against at the moment. Um, I, I I don't know what his poll numbers look like in terms of how his constituency is is following him, but that would be interesting to see. And I don't know, it's, it's a little scary. Another piece though that jumped out to me, though, Dave, yours, yours is a really good point about that. But I was um, following, well, not following, but just kind of listening to the, you know, the um, the the UAW strike. It's like. It's starting to feel like this the UA, this is the old UAW that's back, the one that fights back. <laughs> and, so, and you know, really is, you know, over the last few years we've seen this sort of backing away from unions. I mean, there's sort of a disdain for the union workers. And that's kind of this new leader that they have who's, you know, taking this kind of strategic approach to to how they're doing their strike, um, made an interesting comment today or when maybe it had been yesterday when uh, uh, candidate Trump indicated that he was going to come to Detroit uh, instead of going to the um, debates for the GOP. And the leader of the UAW, interestingly, interesting. UAW, United Sean, Auto Workers. Yeah. UAW, United Auto Workers, I should say. That. Yeah. Sean Fain, an interesting name to begin with. <laughs> Pretty Irish, yeah. <laughs> I know. And he made the comment that uh, basic, basically the effect, we don't need you. You're the one we're fighting against. These billionaires coming in and uh, making these decisions and you're not, that are not concerned about the real working people, which is kind of like Donald Trump in your face. You come here, I guess they're coming after him on, the, on that point because clearly he would be going into, you know, kind of um, whatever he thinks he's doing with regard to union workers. But clearly, this is not um, a playground that he may be welcomed in anymore. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I raised the possibility of people being a little more aggressive in terms of pushing back and yeah, this, making their representatives being more accountable. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think one one place people are pushing back is in the in the labor movement. Um, yes, you know, kind yes. of a renaissance for labor unions, and mm -hmm. you know, you can go from Chipotle to Starbucks to places that never had unions. And people are saying that, you know, uh, this this pay inequity between CEO and upper level management and workers has just been growing and growing over the past few decades. And, um, you know, now we can see those numbers and it's not two times what I make. You now it's a couple hundred times what I make. Many times. It's, it's <laughs> times I, yeah, the differences exactly. are, are jaw dropping. So one situation where I think people are pushing back and we're seeing it with the United Auto Workers strike, but we're seeing a lot of other places, is yeah, where we were saying that, that yeah. you know, this disparity is so far out of hand that um, you know, we're gonna take we're gonna take it into our own hands and we're gonna we're gonna make you pay attention to us and uh, we're gonna go on strike. Yeah. 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 And to give Joe Biden the speech writer credit, <clears throat> that phrase, record profits should generate record wages. <clears throat> That's points right to the economic and power disparity. And the connection should be made. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're rural, white, evangelical, 
older and male, you're still underpaid and underserved. Exactly. You have neither the economic resources nor the political influence or resources, nor the educational access, nor the healthcare affordability access, that the people who are favored by the people that you're identifying with are serving at your expense. Yeah. Again, it's back to that voting against your own best interests. And and that's kind of what's happening. But I, I, I agree with you, David. It's, you're seeing this really resurgence of the labor movement on on a, on a number of levels. I mean, before I think people were sort of lulled into thinking that things were so bad that we had to make these sacrifices and we had to make these concessions and we had to give up so many of the rights and things that we that the unions and stuff had fought and stood for. I mean, just like even with the, um, you know, with the uh, writer's strike, I mean, when the first time there was a writer's strike, um, you know, with that spawn, it spawned these reality shows where you didn't need to necessarily have the writers. And it's like, wait a minute, we, <laughs> what did we just do here? And now you're now saying, wait a minute, it wasn't about the reality. It was, you guys are still making, as you said, a hundred times more than what we're doing. We're still producing. So, so no, we're, we got to take this stance. Uh, so, you, you know, people are really realizing, wait a minute, we got duped into thinking that we were making this valuable sacrifice, you know, for the good of the country, for the good of the economy, and we got screwed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I think that disparity between CEO and workers is um, really fueling some of this activity. I think, mm -hmm. you know, going on strike is hard. Um, you know, you're going to, you know, the UAW strike fund is going to be able to pay you $500 a week. Well, that's good. It's certainly better than nothing, but still you got a family of four or $500 a week. It's not enough. Um, so it's going to, it's going to be hard when you go on strike. So what's going to keep you out there? Well, one thing is kind of this emotional um, aspect of it, that $28 million, the GM CEO made $28 million last year. Now, how, how, how can one person Justify taking away that much money when I'm on a two-tiered payment system where um, uh, you know my wages are lower because I joined the uh, came work for the company after 2007 when this two-tiered wage system came in. Um, I don't get any profit sharing. Um, you know my contributions to my retirement plan uh, are much lower than everybody else. Um, you know I think that when you see that number, that stark number of 28 million dollars, you look at your own situation. That that gives you kind of the the emotional um, incentive to to go forward. It's like I just can't take this anymore. I don't want to take this anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I, and and we didn't see that before when we were hearing during the times that they were making these kind of concessions, where all these you know the economy is going. You know we're we're going the wrong way. We need you to make this sacrifice. We can't make it without you doing this. We didn't have the disclosure about what these. Um, you know, what these CEO you know, wages were about. We didn't, when I was say we, I wasn't in there, but for those that are in, you know, working in those, well, that information wasn't always available. They didn't have it. They could just, you know, buy some form of property and expect that, um, you know, with the threat being that, you know, we're going to lay, lay off people, which they did. Uh, we're going to lay you off or we're going to close this plant. And then people say, oh, we're sorry, we'll, 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 we'll take whatever you give us. Huh? Social media creates a lot of problems. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. As Sandra's sure saying, did. but as Sandra's saying, you know, sometimes it's very valuable in terms of organizing people, you know, in all kinds of different ways, all kinds of different protests, but just an in information sharing, um, it can be extremely valuable and, uh, you know, can kind of people keep people up to date. You know, again, if you're out on a strike and if you're just home, not working, wonder what's going on, um, and you get an offer to come back to work to kind of cross that picket line, and you've really had very little communication, you might be tempted to do that because your family's hungry. Um, you know, and whatever money you're getting wasn't nearly enough. But if you're getting those updates every day and you know what's happening, um, that really can sustain you. So, uh, so yeah, as Sandra was pointed out, um, you know, the fact that, that this is available now, people have that information, um, is very helpful. And that's a really important point because there's a direct close connection 
between that disparity, that concentration of wealth and power, and the behavior that we're seeing in a completely dysfunction, national and in many cases, state leadership as well. The national is worse in many respects. I mean, that's behavior none of us would ever tolerate in our arbitrations, our courtrooms, our homes, and anywhere else. I mean, we just, that that wouldn't be acceptable behavior. But when you get someone like Merrick Garland, uh, who should have been on the U.S. Supreme Court, except for these kinds of manipulations and games for political purposes, who is the top attorney in the nation. He's the head of the Department of Justice. And not once during his hours of testimony do any of Jim Jordan's troops mention or ask about what initiatives is the DOG taking to reduce gun violence, to reduce crime, street crime, to reduce exactly. The, exactly. the major problems that everyday real people, Americans, are impacted by and concerned about. Instead, they're attacking him in very personal, offensive ways, mm -hmm. without factual backup for it, in a completely unproductive session. So what can be offered? What would you offer as an alternative message and communication that would reach people, reach out to people where they live? You know, one thing I think we we probably have not done a good job of doing is kind of being very explicit about what what the future holds if we continue down these paths um, to actually kind of paint the picture of what happens when if you elect a Donald Trump who says that he's going to consolidate authority in the presidency, that he's going to make the Department of Justice uh, attorney his own attorney. Um, that it's all going to be under his control. That could be more efficient that way, um, and we won't waste money, we won't waste time. Um, I think we need to we need to do a better job of of being very explicit about explaining what the consequences are if we follow these these paths. Because I'm not sure we've done a great job of doing that. There's a lot of people who just think, ah, you know, I like it. You know, stick it to the man and you know, rabble rouser and um, be rebels and they don't really think about the consequences. No, no, um, absolutely and, not. And I don't think we've done a great job of explaining that. We're also we've done a really good job of giving them a platform <laughs> and the uh, you know the platform to espouse those views and not challenge them. And that's that's disturbing. I, just like you said, David, the the deer and the Tamara Garland, it should have been about other things. If you're going to call the the you know if you're going to call the attorney general, you need to be talking about you know, what they're doing in, in the office rather than spending time the way it was spent. Uh, and that is, quite honestly, it's it's it's, it's kind of disgusting and insulting. Um, to, but then people don't understand and more responsive to, you know, he he did it to him. He, he, he told him, and that doesn't get you anything. You don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at um, this, the Georgia case. I mean, I'm not sure. It will in the, the DC case as well. The kinds of things that are being said and done by Donald Trump defendant would not be tolerated by any other criminal defendant in any court anywhere in the country. And people are thinking, oh, yeah, it's okay to uh, you know call out the prosecutor and have a you know because, and I and I think the more we do that, the more that sort of thing is, is is, you know it's is, I don't know put it put it out so that people think that's okay to do because I think some people think it is. You're gonna be beginning to also see this tearing away at at the well. You're starting with the Attorney General Merrick Garland. But it's just going to sweep through the entire, you know, the entire justice system. You have, I, well, I don't even want to think about that. What, what, what it could look like in some of our courts if we allow, if that sort of thing is deemed to be okay because you're running for office. Yeah, you know, the media is responsible for 
you know, they're, 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 unfortunately, they're fueling some of this because, you know, they're a business too. And they, they want ratings yeah. and they want people to follow them and they want yeah. people to watch. They want to sensationalize. So whatever you say about Donald Trump, you know, he can, he's kind of sensational to watch. They never quite know what he's going to say or do. And um, so the media follows him. And then Kristen Wilker did that. I don't know if you saw any of that interview. It wasn't an interview. I don't know what that was. But she would ask a question and Donald Trump would just go on some rant and say all kinds of misrepresentations and exaggerations and lies. Then they go to some other related question. It was like, it was a terrible interview. It's like, why are you giving the forum, giving him this forum and giving him this opportunity to, to, to make these misrepresentations, to say these lies? Dave, this one did it for you. <laughs> well, it was painful. But at least I, but I wanted to, I wanted to see what was happening. But I'm so, but I watch it. I'm worried as people are at home listening to it, and the probably some of them are nodding their heads and thinking, "Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's yeah, what's happening." Go get her! Go get her! Yeah. So it's like, oh man. Um, so yeah, so it's troubling that you know the media is also you know they they're, they're really driven fair, by fair. an audience. They want to have an audience. You know, I, I, every day, it's like, this is on the news every single day. Um, aren't there other things we need to talk about? Yeah, like, you know, the, the gun violence is certainly a, a biggie. I mean, just the instance that we're seeing that the, the comfort that people have with, um, you know, with having guns so readily available. And you're hearing now more about these shootings that never should have occurred if people didn't just have a, you know, happen to have a gun, uh, you know. Just recently, the one where the guy's out directing cars away from the front of his house because the deer are crossing, and a car and a guy in a car behind thinks that he's doing something and pulls out the gun and shoots him. He's dead. He got shot in front of in, on his lawn. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not against people having guns. I'm not, it's, it's, but I mean, this notion that you can just you know walk around and carry it in your you know, in your pocket, just in case, you know, something happens that you might need it, or, you know, someone comes to your door and you don't know who it is, you could just shoot them. <laughs> yeah, that? I think, you know, I, you know, when I talk about taking responsibility, you know, I think we, we can't let things be normalized. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to be passive and events like you're describing um, are happening so frequently every day. Mm -hmm. I, I can't watch the news any day without seeing somebody getting murdered by by a weapon, you know, and to the degree that we allow that to become normalized, to think that, oh, okay, you know, you know, it didn't happen in my neighborhood. Um, that's was, that's really frightening. And uh, you know, so we need to be aware of what's happening, that this wasn't always what was happening. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. And uh, we need to push back. How do we do that? Well, how do we have to remind people that this isn't the way it needed to be? That you, yeah, know, well, you certainly are entitled to defend yourself and to defend your, you know, your family and your property and stuff. But how do we how do we get that across? I'm 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 getting a little worried. Yeah, I think that. I go back to what I was saying earlier that, I mean, people get to be get to go to Washington and you know get treated like mini royalty as you know, governmental representatives and members of Congress and the Senate. I think we we have to call them out. You know, and and say that um, these are the issues that concern us. You know, violence and and the level of violent crimes and the use of guns is something that has changed my life. Um, you know, I think about um, yeah. whether or not I want to attend a, a mass gathering, a concert, or a game or something in ways yeah. I never did before, because there's a possibility now that something really bad's going to happen, and um, and we want to return to a world where we didn't have to have that that reflection. And um, you have the power in your hands to do something about it. Um, you can actually implement um, some gun gun legislation and restrictions mm -hmm. um, that can be helpful to us. So so do it, or we're not going to we're not going to send you back to Washington. And in our last minute or two, I think. A point that both of you have really emphasized and really needs to be front and center, and neither the media nor the political leaders have done this, is accountability. It is the consequence of responsibility. Your responsibility has progressed to a point where it's actually harmful. 
there are people who are responsible for causing that harm. And there are people who are responsible for preventing and apprehending those who cause the harm. So maybe a focus on we are going to prioritize accountability for both the causing of harm and for the elimination of protections against it. Economically, healthcare, safety, education, all yeah. of those. Yeah. That, and I'm, 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 I'm back to, as you express those, those perspectives, I'm back to the view that the, the, the group that's most capable of doing that are the younger folks who are vastly more impacted by these things now than any of us ever will, who see that and really don't want to have to live and continue to live in a society that does not value life in that way. So, and I mean, it's, I, I think that's, I still think that's going to happen. I still think that's really, really happening. Um, certainly. Yeah, I guess, you know, in closing, I just want to remind people that we have some control over what is a normal life and what's a normal world. So, so we don't have to sit back and just accept things as they're developing and let the normal happen around us, that it can be something as simple as, you don't have to be out in the street protesting because that's not who you are and what you're comfortable doing. It can just be a letter or phone call to your representative to yes. let them know what you believe. So there's all kinds of levels of involvement, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there may be levels with which you're uncomfortable. That that doesn't mean you you don't have to do that. You shouldn't do anything. So maybe that's the question for voters. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. When you vote. Can you have the courage to vote for those who you really believe will take the most responsibility to protect the things, the values that are most important to you and your family and your community? Think Tech Hawaii, thanks so much for joining us. Judge Sandra Sims, Professor David Larson, thanks so much for your time, your insights, your perspective. Aloha, thank you, take care.